The two most popular chess players at the moment are, of course, Hans Niemann and former world champion Vladimir Kramnik. As about two weeks ago, I recorded a video for my channel to um, discuss a game, or better said, two games. The two uh, legends of the game uh, played against each other and the beef they, uh, they have now. And since then, more developments uh, are there. So first of all, let's make a small uh, recap of that. And then I will show you the new game they played against each other. So after the, the two games they, uh, they played, Vladimir Kramnik recorded his, um, his own video, gave his insights of, uh, of Hans, his play. Didn't really accuse him of, uh, of cheating, but of course he is suspicious and, uh, well, who knows what uh, his uh, exact conclusions are. You can watch his own uh, video, of course. Hans said, okay, let's have a training camp together. I know you, Vlad, you're going to be in uh, Amsterdam as uh, from the 22nd of September. There is a uh, chess event, a friendly tournament organized by uh, Ilya Levitov with a lot of uh, strong uh, grandmasters participating, including Kramnik. And Hans said, okay, Vlad, let's have a training camp. You can see how strong I am. What do you think about my play? Let's do that. And after that, Vlad said, okay, uh, I will think about it. He, in fact, uh, tried to uh, invite him to, uh, to come to Amsterdam. And I think it's not really clear yet if Hans is going to come or not to Amsterdam. But that's going to be definitely interesting as the organizer, Levitov, is trying to, to make it work. So let's see. That could be a very nice meetup between uh, Vladimir Kramnik and Hans Niemann. But before that... Just last night, they uh, played another very interesting game with Vladimir Kramnik playing with the white pieces. Let's have a look at this game. There are some very instructive moments to, to have a look at. So let's go. Vladimir goes for knight f3, d5, g3, the ratey opening. It's considered to be one of the openings to avoid a theoretical battle. Nowadays, there is quite a lot of uh, theory, but still, it's one of the less forcing type of uh, opening uh, variations. Hans played knight c6. That's an interesting move with the idea to bring the other pawn to the center so the knight supports that uh, pawn. And the principled move now is to play the move d4. When we have some sort of Chigorin defense in which the knight on c6 is not that uh, greatly placed, uh, positionally speaking, it blocks the pawn from c7 to come forward. But it's a modern line and it's uh, quite popular, in fact. Bishop f5, bringing the bishop out, bishop g2 e6, castling kingside, and here, knight b4, typical idea, so that the uh, bishop and knight are both attacking the pawn on uh, c2. Kramnik goes for knight e1, that's a good defensive move, I mean, you don't really want to go back with your knight, but you definitely don't want to give up that pawn on uh, c2. Knight f6 was played, black continues with develop development, and white goes c3, so the knight will be forced to go back, knight c6, Bishop g5, the bishop is developed, pins the knight on uh, f6, and after bishop e7, knight d2, all white's minor pieces are uh, developed now. Okay, the knight on e1 is not greatly placed, but will soon get back into, uh, into the game. One of white's ideas here is that if you castle, for instance, with black, you're going to take, bishop takes, and then the move e4 can be played, and the position will be open. Black is uh, slightly worse in such positions because I believe bishop is good, knight on c6 doesn't exert pressure against that uh, pawn on uh, d4. So Hans instead, I mean, he doesn't want to allow that, uh, that exchange on f6, he wants to maintain the grip on the e4 square. He goes knight e4 and after bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, white plate f3, attacking the knight on uh, e4. I should mention that the knight of course can be taken, but after black recaptures uh, either first with a bishop or immediately with a pawn on uh, e4. That pawn on e4 is kind of um, an annoying piece restricting the movement of, um, of uh, white's pieces. So therefore f3 was played, knight takes d2, queen takes d2 and white is about to launch its e-pawn. That is the main idea. After e4 you put pressure against the bishop as well as against the pawn on d5. The knight will come to d3 very soon. Interesting moment as black is just one move away from completing its development. I would have expected here just a solid move like castling kingside. Maybe white is a little bit better but it's very equalish. Hans has his own ideas. Decides to castle queenside. We have opposite castled kings and that means it's gonna be 
really sharp. The game will explode, not immediately, but just in a couple of moves, we may expect one side to uh, launch an attack. White played move e4. If you do take on e4, f takes e4, white gains more influence in the center. So black is not really tempted to take right now, just drops back with the bishop to g6, so that the bishop on g2 is not as great. I mean, it's still hindered by the pawn on uh, f3. White goes knight e3. So the knight is uh, nicely placed in um, in um, different, uh, well, in different positions. There are different plans, of course. You, you may go with the knight to f4. You may come with a knight to c5 to look after the black king. Anyway, Hans goes for h5. This is the move we have been waiting for. So black is about to go h4, open up the king side and this that's of course one of the main drawbacks of having weakened your uh, king side with moves like g3 and f3 white played h4 radical way of stopping the h pawn of coming uh, any further it's of course another weakening move but at least for the moment black is not able to uh, to break through and look what hans does now he plays the move e5 he says that okay i want to open the center and when the center gets opened your king White's king is definitely more vulnerable, but it's very concrete and I'm pretty sure that Flood had been anticipating it uh, in advance. E takes d5, so you're attacking the knight, rook recaptures the pawn and now white goes f4 with the idea to put pressure against the pawn on e5, but more importantly the diagonal for the bishop is open, so the rook is threatened to be taken. Black has no choice, got to, got to play here the move e4 so that it saves the pawn and the rook is no longer under threat and pawn on e4 looks looks good for instance if you put the rook on the e file to pin the pawn black doesn't get time to uh, take the knight on uh, d3 black will go ahead here with f5 and that's a protected past pawn and it will be very difficult to um to eliminate that pawn so the bishop on g2 remains out of play therefore flood had a different idea he played the move f5, preventing black ever from supporting the pawn on uh, e4. That's a very interesting move. It attacks the bishop. Of course, the knight on d3 can still not be taken as the rook is hanging on uh, d5. If you take with the rook that pawn on f5, there is bishop a3 and the uh, rook is in trouble. White is uh, winning material thanks to this uh, pin. So instead, bishop takes f5 was played. And... That's a pawn. It's a very nice pawn. If black gets time, he will move the bishop back and go ahead with f5 and try to support a pawn on e4 anyway. But now rook a e1 was uh, played, so more pressure on that pawn on uh, e4. There are a lot of ideas, including knight f4, maybe sometimes rook takes f5, rook takes f5, bishop h3 is another idea. So anyway, the bishop goes back to h7. The bishop has done its job. And black really wants to get in the move f5. So white plays knight f4, attacking the rook on uh, on d5. And where should the rook go? Well, the rook doesn't have that many great squares to go to. You don't really want to stay somewhere on the fifth rank because the rook can easily be attacked. Hans decided, okay, let's drop back with the rook to d8 so that the rooks are connected. It's a very sensible move. Maybe a move like rook d6 is also quite reasonable. But in any case, after rook d8, Knight takes h5 on the board, so white regains the pawn on uh, h5. And we have an open game. White's king is open, but also his rooks seem to be a little bit more active than, uh, than black's. But it's black's turn. And black plays the move f5, supporting the pawn on e4. The queen protects the pawn on g7. Very sharp game. And the question is whether these pawns on f5 and e4, are they really strong, restricting the movement of white pieces, or are they just targets for these uh, same pieces? Queen g5 played, very interesting move, offering the exchange of queens. And if the exchange of queens is accepted, then uh, the knight is able to come back to f4. I think white's position is slightly to be preferred here, but black doesn't have to accept this uh, exchange. Played here the move g6, attacking the knight on h5, and still white can go for the exchange of queens now himself which was not done in the game. After knight f4, the bishop looked bad on h7, but it will come back into the game. And I like these pawns. There is no pressure against it. And uh, if I had to choose a side, it would probably be, uh, be black. But Hans, um, 
I mean, Vladimir uh, didn't uh, play the move queen takes e7. He went for knight f6, adventurous move. So the bishop looks pretty uh, odd on uh, on h7. But first, black should try to get rid of that knight on f6. And there are two possible ways, either rook d6 or rook f8. And in the game, rook df8 was played. It's a very logical move, but it's objectively speaking, not the best move. Kamnik didn't profit from uh, this move. He may have considered here a totally insane move. Maybe it was not even considered by both players. There is this move, bishop takes e4. Getting rid of that pawn. And the idea is that if you uh, take on e4, rook takes e4, this queen is in trouble. Uh, White is launching a devastating attack. He has two pawns for the piece. This bishop looks very bad. And there are nice attacking ideas. For instance, queen d6, queen goes away, queen g4, check. And if the, the king goes to b8, it's knight d7 with a deadly knight fork. So that looks very bad. And if the king goes to d8, then it's rook e6. And all of a sudden, the queen on d6 is trapped. So that is one idea of bishop takes e4. I want to show you one more line before we go back to the game. You may even take that knight on f6, which was just under threat by both the queen and the rook. Now the idea is to go bishop takes f5 with check. Another piece sacrifice with the point that now there is rook e8. You're trying to deflect the rook from protecting the queen. After rook takes e8, queen takes f6. We have this unusual situation of a queen versus a rook and two minor pieces. This is totally unclear. But definitely this is something white should have been aiming for. Instead, he goes for knight takes h7, trading off that knight for that very poor bishop. Queen takes h7 on the board, and I think black is on top. These pawns are really strong, and white doesn't have a good way of challenging these pawns. What should black do right now? Well, the plan is to improve that knight from c6, to chase away that queen from g5. And that can be done with move like knight e8, followed by either knight e6 or knight f7. If the queen goes away, then black will continue with the plan of opening up the files towards the white king. With the move g5, the file will eventually be opened. There's not much white can do against it. d5 was played, and now the knight can go for its uh, original uh, plan. With the move knight e8, queen e3, attacking the pawn on a7, no need to sacrifice it, just a simple solid move, king b8. White goes c4, knight f7, the knight is coming into play, queen f4, so that g5 is sort of discouraged. If g5 you can take on f5 and um, uh, the pawn is, uh, is just hanging, but queen g7 is an excellent move. It's not that you really want to take the pawn on b2, but you're looking for squares to infiltrate with your queen. If you protect the pawn, for instance, with b3, then the knight can now come to e5. The queen is supporting that knight jump, knight e3 will come, and black is gonna take over. Knight e3 is coming next. Instead, there follow the move c5. White is looking for counterplay against the black king. Queen d4 check. That's a multiple attack on all these pawns. Queen e3 back, and now queen takes d5, eliminating a very important central pawn. Rook d1 attacking the queen, queen goes back, and black is a pawn up. And look, it's not just a pawn on e4, it also means that the bishop on g2 remains out of play. White just continues, it's like sort of um, all or nothing uh, approach. Knight comes to e5, white goes b5, and now of course... That aforementioned plan of installing a knight on d3 cannot be recommended now because of rook takes d3 and the pawn on e4 is pinned. That loses the, the piece. If I were black, I would think, okay, I'm a big pawn up. Probably I will go for rook d8, offering the exchange of pieces and black is totally in control. But Hans played here the move knight g4, attacking the queen. Queen goes to d4 and the idea is that now white can... Uh, no longer control the g5 square. Black goes for g5. That's a great move. H takes g5. But if you have a great position, it's always the question whether you should go for an attack, mess things up, or keep it simple. Therefore, I like that move with rook d8, as I mentioned earlier. Now, you have to prove yourself and show that you're able to deliver checkmate. Queen g8 is by far the best move, so that 
you're planning to go with a queen to h7 and these pieces are covering the back rank very carefully. Instead, Hans went for queen g6. Very understandable move. But the problem is, and that was not seen by both players, that white can actually now take with a bishop on e4. And that is a very important move. This had to be played. The idea is that the bishop can't be taken because one pair of rooks is going to be exchanged removing a very important defender of the back rank and now with the queen sacrifice white is able to deliver checkmate of course the bishop doesn't have to be taken but if black continues with the plan of delivering checkmate with uh, queen h5 threatening mate on a2 white goes rook d2 bishop covers h1 rook covers h2 and there's still everything to play for instead of bishop takes e4 there follow the move b6 hoping to open up black's king but white is too slow queen h5 threatening checkmate on h2 that is a serious threat so white needs either to do something about it or be very fast first first the pawn on c7 is captured with check king takes queen d6 king c8 and well you can give one more check on d7 but then the king will run away into the corner and that's absolutely fine so instead of that move queen d7 rook fe1 was played so that after queen h2 king f1 the king can still try to run away mate is not there immediately but next move f4 it's totally crushing the f file is gonna be opened and if you take the pawn it's rook takes f4 the queen protects the rook on f4 so white cannot really eliminate the uh, rook now and if you go king e2 it's just queen takes g2 with checkmate so you understand that that pawn on f4 cannot really be uh, taken. Queen e6 check on the board. King goes to b8. And it's either going to be f3 or f takes g3 with a crushing attack. So white play the desperate move. Rook d8 deflecting the rook from the f file. But okay, a rook is a rook. So you just take it. Vladimir's um, idea was now to take the pawn on e4. And of course, f takes g3 is not coming with check and note that white is actually in this position threatening to deliver checkmate himself with the queen and bishop by taking on b7 with uh, with the queen but now beautiful move i mean you're a rook up and there's probably more than one way to uh, to finish off the game but the best move by far is the move f3 after which white resigned guys this is a very nice tactical shot the diagonal is close so the cooperation between the bishop and queen is stuck there's no mate on b7 if you take with the bishop on f3 it's queen f2 with uh, checkmate the king can't go anywhere if you take the knight on g4 it's queen takes g2 with checkmate the alternative is to take with the queen on f3 still there's this mating threat on b7 but after rook h2 f8 the white queen is no longer allowed to uh, to leave the f file because of that king on f1 you are going to win the white queen and mate will follow very soon. So this is another big victory for Hans Niemann against former world champion Vladimir Kramnik. I'm curious to hear from you. What do you think of this game? It was just a brilliant game by Hans. Typical blitz game. Uh, mistakes by both sides. But the big question, of course, is are Hans Niemann and Vladimir Kramnik to meet each other next week in Amsterdam? I'm very curious to hear about it so stay tuned for more developments on this channel and don't forget to subscribe bye bye